Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining in with us. Uh, my name is John Spann. I'm curator. I'm serve as curator of education and interpretation here at the two Mississippi museums. We want to welcome you to the Behind the Scenes with Dr. Doris Derby program. This program highlights our new photography exhibit titled I Am a Man, a compilation of civil rights photographs between the 1960 and 1970. This project was actually guest curated by Bill Ferris. And here today, we have one of the photographers um, on, on for a discussion, an interview about her involvement in the uh, exhibit, I Am a Man. And we have today Dr. Doris Derby, who served as a civil rights photographer, educator, and field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, during the Mississippi Freedom Movement. Her renowned phot photographs have been presented in museums and galleries across the nation for depicting the lives and the work of the people who fought for racial justice, civil rights, uh, racial justice and civil rights in the South. Derby previously served as the founding director for the Office of African American Student Services and Programs at Georgia State University, as well as associate professor of anthropology. So today we want to welcome Dr. Doris Derby, renowned photographer and civil rights activist for this program. How are you doing, Dr. Derby? Good. Good, good afternoon. How are you? Doing, I'm well. doing well. Doing well. Well, first of all, I want to say that you are, you are more than that to me. You're a friend of mine, I, I like to say, a um, uh, uh, second, second mother uh, with our just like involvement over the years and me studying your work. Um, as a civil rights activist here in Mississippi, um, your involvement with Tougaloo College and SNCC has been uh, amazing. Uh, just for me learning about regular uh, people, people who weren't just like well known and folks who were on, had boots on the ground uh, here in Mississippi making a difference. So we want to first get into our first uh, interview question with you. Um, even though you spent a lot of time here in Mississippi doing the work uh, hands on the ground with the folks here in Mississippi. You are not a native Mississippian. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your background, where you come from, and how you got involved here in the Mississippi movement? Well, I'm, I was born in New York. Uh, I'm from the Bronx. Uh, that's where I grew up. And um, I, uh, my father was um, certainly a person who was uh, had to be in the struggle early on as he faced discrimination in the North. He faced it uh, in jobs. He faced it in his uh, university, University of Pennsylvania, uh, where uh, he, he told us a story that he went to uh, uh, accept some awards for athletics. Uh, he was a civil engineering student, but he went, he was uh, outstanding in, in a couple of different um, fields of sports. And when he went to the facility to receive the awards, they told him he had to use the, the uh, servant's elevator. And so he did not receive them. He left. And um, that was just one of the stories he told us. He talked about how he faced discrimination when he got into the engineering field. And he got out of that eventually, and he also faced discrimination in the New York State Civil Service, um, Employment Service. And so he founded, he co-founded an organization to fight discrimination. Uh, he had, uh, he and his three co-workers uh, secure the services of Constance Baker Modley, outstanding NAACP attorney. They eventually won the case uh, and uh, the discrimination that he faced was on the managerial level where you could not tell uh, that there was discrimination. You could not easily tell that because the, it was the managers who were discriminating, uh, saying that those blacks that uh, tried out for the oral exam failed the oral exam. So um, discrimination was not something new to me. Segregation certainly was. At any rate, I joined the NACP when I was 16 years old. And um, when I was a student at Hunter College in the Bronx, I became active with uh, the student government, the NACP, and the Protestant Students Council. And we went to uh, North Carolina 
to uh, during the time when SNCC was organizing, and uh, we we had we had a freedom ride, an integrated group from Hunter College. So um, we investigated what was happening with the sit-ins and talked to the students and other people. So I was really uh, already on board uh, in terms of the knowledge of discrimination and what kinds of uh, actions needed to be taken. And um, uh, I got involved uh, at Hunter College, as I mentioned, and the, um, uh, the students wanted to um, uh, be involved. And one of my friends decided to go to Albany, Georgia to work in the, the spring of 1962. I graduated from college that year and started teaching elementary school. Um, I had the vacation during that summer of 62 and decided among other things to go to Albany, Georgia to see this friend of mine who was working with SNCC. I had only anticipated going there for a week, but I ended up staying the entire summer, getting involved in all the civil rights activities, worked with um, Andrew Young, C.T. Vivian, uh, Dave Goff, David Abernathy, Martin Luther King, uh, all the SNCC leaders that were working here, Charles Sherrod, Jim Foreman, mm -hmm. um, several of them. And when I came back to New York uh, at the end of the summer, um, they, Bob Moses, who was working in Mississippi, um, heard about me and um, eventually that spring asked me if I would go to Mississippi to work in an adult education program. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I said that I was not available, but after this is the spring of 63. Uh, after I saw what was happening with the dogs and the billy clubs and the fire hoses uh, on TV in Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama, I decided that the least I could do would be to go to Mississippi for a year and uh, work in a literacy project since that was part of my field of education as an elementary school teacher at the time. So that's how I got to Mississippi. Uh, I, I left for Mississippi uh, a few days after the march on Washington. I went there for one year and ended up staying for nine years. That's, thank you for taking us through that. Now, while you were in Mississippi, I know you got involved in Tougaloo College. And while you were on Tougaloo's campus, you expressed yourself uh, in various artistic ways. I, I know one of the things I studied about you is that you and, and two other people, um, like with Bob O'Neill and some, uh, another person, created the Free Southern Theater. Um, so you had also started utilizing your skills as a photographer there as well, am I correct? Yes, of course. Uh, um, different uh, activities that I was involved in spanned over a, a period of time. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Mississippi in 1963, August of 1963, I went there to work in as a field secretary for SNCC and worked in COFO and was organizing to get the literacy program uh, for SNCC established. And it was based, it was going to be based at Tulu College. Um, so uh, for the early time that I was there, I primarily worked out of the COFO office with uh, different uh, the political activities, the voting activities. As I said, I was working on organizing the uh, getting staff for the literacy program. I was the first one to be involved with that. And um, so we did get the literacy program started towards the end of the fall and I moved out to Tougaloo. Um, at that time, uh, one of the other SNCC workers uh, was also recruited to work at the, in the literacy project, and that was John O'Neill. And during that time, John O'Neill, myself, and another uh, worker, uh, civil rights worker, Gilbert Moses, who was working with the uh, editing the Mississippi Free Press. And the three of us used to talk about um, 
what we needed uh, in the arts because all of us were involved with the arts. I was in painting, dancing, and uh, poetry, spoken word. And of course, John and Gilbert were in uh, theater and acting, writing, um, all aspects of the theater. So we just decided that we needed a cultural arm of SNCC and it would be the Free Southern Theater, a repertory theater. And so we established it that year and it ended up lasting until about 1985. And the, the repertory theater would uh, take plays uh, around the state of Mississippi and other Southern states and even New York uh, to um, you know, give uh, the black community a forum for what we wanted to achieve in life, uh, our comings and goings, uh, all the things that were happening to us and have um, a outlet for yeah. the arts and to uh, reflect what was happening in the civil rights movement. There's so many things that uh, I could talk about, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Right. So, um, so let's, while let's... I was, but while I was at Tougaloo College, uh -huh. I also painted. Uh, okay. Ronald Schnell, who was the art department chair, had a big studio on campus in which he would uh, allow anybody who was interested in painting, you could just go knock on his door because he lived on campus and he would go over and uh, take you and let you into the studio. So I was able to accomplish a lot of uh, oil paints, paintings, mm -hmm. uh, which I, ha I am putting into a book right now, actually. Um, the pictures of my paintings and my poetry and my prose. I wrote a lot of poetry that year. Mainly, that was about the only year that I wrote it, but I did write a lot. And um, I did publish a book of my poetry. Great. My photographs, I just, I took a small amount of photographs in the early 60s, very early when, it was, when I first went to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. joined up with a group called Southern Media mm -hmm. in the mid, mid to late 60s. And that's when we were a team and we went all over the country of the state um, documenting uh, the life and actions and activities of the movement of local people, men, women, children. So yeah. that's what I have is a lot of, like I have thousands of photographs. Right. Probably 10,000 photographs. And in this exhibit, I am a man, we share uh, a few of those photographs that you, that you uh, just expounded on. Uh, so we wanna take our first slide and actually show one of the cameras that you used in taking uh, those photographs throughout Mississippi. Um, this is a Yashica camera that we actually have on display in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And Dr. Derby, could you go into like how you acquired this camera and how often you used it in the field? Well, my primary camera when I came to Mississippi was a Pentax. Okay. That was my favorite. But um, as, and that was the one I used primarily uh, in the first year few years. After I joined with the team of the other photographers, many, some of them were, you know, really, uh, some were trainees and some were trainors, trainers. And uh, so uh, as I joined the team, they said I should have some other cameras because we were going to be traveling and taking a lot of photographs. So um, uh, Ed Long, who was uh, one of the team members, uh, suggested I get a Yashika. So I actually got two Yashikas. Uh, this is just one of them. Uh, I gave the other one to my nephew eventually after I left, uh, well, many years later. So I had two Yashikas and a Pentax, and I used to carry all three of them. One on each arm and one in the front. And I had my a knapsack and my photography bag. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, believe it or not, I took a lot of photographs in a dress or a yeah. skirt. Uh, I only wore pants when I had to, when we went out into the 
uh, farms and um, out in the rural areas. If I had to get on top of a car to take photographs, I had, had those uh, blue jeans on. But um, I had a lot of different lenses that I would take off and put on the camera. So let's, let's discuss some actual photographs that we have in the exhibit. Um, now, um, now you, may have, you, you said you were armed to the hilt with cameras. You had about three cameras with you in your, your knapsack and your camera bag. Um, here is one photograph to start off uh, of a protest. Uh, and I think it's of protesting the uh, YMCA in downtown Jackson, the white YMCA. Could you give us a little background of this story and how you uh, found this is significant to photograph? Well, um, if you look on the left-hand side, you see the man with the camera. He was our team leader, Bill Peltz, okay. uh, who uh, taught part-time at Millsaps College. And um, he was actually the one who recruited me to work with Southern Media Incorporated. And he, he and Bill, um, Gary Morton started this program to train uh, young people in Mississippi on uh, cameras and to be uh, filmmakers. So uh, these students, these young people, young men, were protesting at the downtown Jackson YMCA because the YMCA on Farris Street in the black community, uh, you know, we had, there was segregation that during, during that time and the black pool did not have a swimming pool. So that was one of the primary things that the young men were protesting. But um, so they wanted to close the pool uh, or integrate it. And um, they were expressing, uh, you know, their, uh, their displeasure at the fact that they couldn't go swimming. And, you know, a lot of uh, black children uh, drown because they don't have swimming experience. So that's what that was about. Uh, within the context of many other demonstrations that were going on in Jackson. So, so when you are for t when you were photograph uh, like photographing a, a protest or a march during uh, this time period, what was your thought process in trying to capture uh, the essence through your lens? What were you looking for? Well, I'm always looking for uh, the expression. I'm looking for uh, to see who's involved and what the action is. Um, it's just each each time you take a photograph, it's different depending on uh, what the subject is and you know what the action is and where you can move around. Um, so many different factors to take into into consideration. Gotcha. But I, I like to, um, especially get photographs of children that were involved in the civil rights movement. So this was not uh, just a, you know, a march of, of uh, men. And uh, this young, these young men were saying, you know, they're, they're young men, they're men, they're going to be men, mm -hmm. and they want to make change. But uh, there were a lot of women that were involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, so even when uh, we have signs like I am a man, there are many women and girls in the same marches. So now that this exhibit, I am a man, is on display currently at the two Mississippi museums, um, we, it, 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 like you stated, it shows various styles, various uh, artists, and their different ways of depicting protests. But you actually are the only female photographer in this exhibit. So what do you think sets you apart um, and how does your lens as a black woman from the Bronx uh, help you to portray subjects in your, in your photography? <laughs> well, that's a pretty complex question. Um, I guess the photographs that I have taken, uh, I, I want to have a variety of photographs that depict all the different aspects of, of human life, of the life that uh, our people were living in Mississippi at that time, all different aspects, the everyday activities, the side activities, 
um, the professional, the non-professional, the farming, the children, the women, all of that is very important to me. And uh, I wanna have a, the emotion and um, uh, the, I like to have the environment, you know, the background to show. I, the main thing is that I was taking photographs to document our lives, what we're doing, what we're accomplishing, what our struggles are, were, are today. And uh, to show people that times haven't changed a whole lot. We have made progress, yes. And we take two steps forward and then somebody uh, makes it so that there's one step backward. So um, my photographs, I've always wanted to be able to document and have visual images to say, this is what we were doing then. Um, I remember that when I was in elementary school, uh, fourth, fifth grade, and it was a predominantly white elementary school, there was only one black teacher, uh, neighborhood school. And I remember saying, where are we in these, in the books, in the movies that we see? Why aren't we there? Because we are accomplishing a lot. I had stories, oral histories from my grandparents. And I knew that we had accomplished a lot. I knew what my great grandparents had accomplished. I knew that my grandfather, my mother's side was an outstanding businessman in Bangor, Maine that everyone respected. I knew that my grandmother uh, who had 11 children, that she was a member of the a founding member of the NAACP in Bangor, Maine in the 1920s. I knew that my, my uncle, her eldest son, integrated the Bangor Symphony Orchestra as an excellent violinist. I knew that he also grad, uh, uh, integrated the university there. Mm -hmm. I knew that my great aunt was a missionary in Liberia in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. I have letters from her. So why aren't we hearing about the things that our grandparents, our great grandparents, I knew that my grandfather was in the 1898 Spanish American War. Why aren't we being depicted in uh, the movies? My girlfriends and I used to go to the movies every Saturday and we were just dying to see a black person in the films. Yeah. So where were they? Well then we have to do this ourselves. We have to put our own images there. And so that was something that I knew that I was going to do that was my God-given mission. And that was one of the things, but then you have to have education mm -hmm. and um, you have to be creative. You have to be involved in the arts so that you can always have your mind going and imagining what could be because it might not be there for you to see where you can see it because you may not have access to books you may not have access to films so you make pictures and films and everything in your own mind and when you can you do it in the real so yeah. that's always been my motivation what you said was very powerful um because the things that you were thinking about then young uh children of color, black children, they're still thinking that now. Um, whether there is a lot of representation of themselves in videos and photographs, but is it a positive representation? Is it a negative representation? Uh, is it an adequate representation? So that, that issue is still being dealt with today. And so what you said was if you, you didn't see it, so you put it on yourself to do it yourself, uh, to create a space where um, people in your community were represented and could see themselves. So that is uh, very powerful. And I hope that, you know, we continue to take that example from you and continue creating um, places or, or events or photographs or things because represent, representation matters, representation matters. Um, and so with that being said, we're gonna go to our next slide that actually these slides, these photographs that you took are actually from the Liberty House Co-op. Um, and this is a co-op that you had a very strong ties to and involvement in. And this is a set of three photographs that we, I would like for you to expound upon. Like what uh, were these photographs depicting? 
what was the Liberty House's goal, um, and how did these how did this co-op affect you know change and economic growth in these communities as well? Well, if you go back to the first slide, okay. Ken. All right, so this slide depicts a meeting, the uh, quarterly meeting of the um, leadership of the handcraft cooperatives that were formed uh, beginning in 1965. Uh, Jesse Morris, who's standing there, is the, and, uh, uh, I guess, the director uh, who um, started the Poor People's Corporation, which uh, had different um, uh, entities uh, under the, its umbrella. So uh, we started out uh, in 1965. I joined uh, towards the end of 1965. And um, the idea was to provide um, organizational and business information and training in order to uh, help many people in Mrs. Black people who were, uh, had been doing sharecropping and other kinds of jobs. And once they got involved in the civil rights movement in any way, they were fired from their job unless they decided uh, they were willing to stop and desist any type of civil rights activity. And uh, the momentum of the civil rights movement in Mississippi started and people were tired of segregation. They were fed up with racism and brutality and they decided to stand up and they lost their jobs. So they were thrown off the land. So we had to find some other ways uh, through economic development as one part of the puzzle. Uh, you know, voting and political activity was one aspect of the puzzle of getting out of uh, doing away with segregation and getting the vote and then economic development. So uh, co-ops would be uh, established. Uh, you, I was one of the persons who would go to the field and try to organize along with there were other SNCC folks that were working in Mississippi. And if uh, a group of people wanted to establish a co-op, then we would go there and train them as to how to start something. And we were starting handcraft cooperatives. This meant that uh, we, through Liberty House, we would see what cooperative uh, handcraft could be pr produced. So for example, we decided uh, one time that we could have a product of uh, candle making. So uh, who knew how to make candles? Well, we found out uh, where there was a place that would teach us how to make candles. And I went away for two weeks and got trained on how to make candles and came back and trained a group to make candles. Then we had uh, uh, some volunteers who would come and work with groups, train them how to make uh, handbags or leather crafts or children's toys, etc., cetera, dolls. Um, dashikis, all kinds of handcrafts. And um, Liberty House was the marketing co-op. So we had producer co-ops. Those were the uh, co-ops all over the, the state. And then we had a warehouse and we would pick up the products. We had uh, a delivery person who would pick up the products. We also wore, uh, ordered the raw materials and the raw materials would be taken to the group and pick up their finished goods and then be sold uh, out of the warehouse through a mail order catalog primarily. And we also established stores. There were people all over the country that wanted to sell hand cramps. And some wanted to just have a Liberty House store and sell just our products, so primarily our products. And then there were other stores, retail stores, that would purchase our products wholesale and then sell them. Now, in addition to going through retail stores, we also would go to different um, activities and set up a table and sell the products. So in this case, 
uh, there were three of us. There's actually three of us in this picture. Mm -hmm. On top of the band, there's a young man sitting there, oh, yeah. a white fella. And he was the designer and the primary person that did the uh, made up the designs for the products and did the designs for our catalog. Ian Tumlin, who was from England, and he came over and decided he liked what we were doing. And he actually uh, started working with us and stayed until the end of uh, when the uh, Liberty House and the Pork Ribs uh, Corporation co-ops uh, stopped in the, I think it was the early 90s. So we were selling uh, all of uh, several of our products at Woodstock yeah. uh, Music Festival. So this photograph is actually you in Woodstock at the Woodstock Music Festival, the famous one with Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, that's me sitting there with the hat there, hat mm -hmm. on, sitting down. And another uh, young lady that worked with us, she's standing up, and um, Ian Tumlin is sitting on the top of the van. We drove that van from Mississippi with all our products. Wow. And we stayed at the Woodstock Festival for four or five days selling our products. Now, and I used to do that a lot. Uh, from time to time, I would go and I would uh, go to uh, travel around the country, trying to find markets for our products, go to uh, wholesale shows. And uh, I was on radio and television advertising our products. So I had... I had quite a time, uh, a good time. I'm sure you uh, did. Doing a lot of different activities. I trained part of the time. I would do public relations and sales promotion um, and uh, yeah. several different activities so, to promote so, the Liberty House. So we actually that, have a case in the uh, Mississippi Civil Rights Museum that showcases a lot of those products from the handcraft co-ops and leathercraft co-ops and uh, things that were marketed by Liberty House uh, that you donated to us. Um, and so we have a large case in, in the museum uh, depicting those things. And we also um, have a lot of things that are not on display. And we actually have a film um, that, is going, that is actually showcasing uh, what we have in our collections. And it's going to be uh, led and narrated by our collections director, Nan Prince. So we're going to ask our IT people to play that short video. OK. My name is Nan Prince. I'm Director of Collections for the Museum Division at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And we are responsible for collecting the 3D artifacts that are in the department's holdings. And typically when people want to donate something to us, I ask them to send me a little bit of a history of it along with the photograph. And I show that uh, history and that photograph to a collections committee that meets once a month. And the committee decides whether or not to bring something into the collection. So if you'll follow me, I'll show you some artifacts that Dr. Derby donated. This is a canvas bag that was made by a fabric co-op, a local Mississippi co-op, and that was sold in the Liberty House here in Jackson. And this is a leather bag that was sold in the Liberty House. And on these shelves, we've got a purple canvas bag, and a green bag. Both of these were made by a local co-op and sold at the Liberty House. And this bag was actually used by Dr. Derby as she was in the field taking photographs. We keep most of our artifacts stored in cabinets like these. And our smaller artifacts we try to store in boxes like these that we make here in-house so that if we move the artifacts we're actually just moving the box and not the artifacts themselves. And this is an example of an artifact that Dr. Derby gave us. This was made by a leather crafting co-op and sold at the Liberty House. And here is another example of a necklace. And we also have some earrings. My name is Nan Prince. I'm Director of Collections for the Museum Division at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And we are responsible for collecting mm -hmm. the 3D artifacts that are mm -hmm. in the department's mm -hmm. holdings. Okay. Okay. Keep going. okay. So <laughs> we had a little 
we'll uh, cut short of the video. But as you can see, we have a lot of things in our collections um, that are on this that are on display and not on display uh, that we have stored uh, that represent co-ops that represent the things that Dr. Derby was working uh, working with local people here in Mississippi and trying to better themselves economically and uh, de other things dealing with social justice. Um, some of the next slides that we're going to uh, talk about are highlighting children and doctors as well. Um, so I know you had mentioned in talking previously that you took a lot of photographs of children and trying to uh, just depict their, um, their sentiment and their passion and their voice through your lens. So uh, we have a, a, a few photographs of these children that, that I would like for you to talk about. Um, I think these photographs are actually from the Mississippi Delta during, um, during some you know, e medical examinations that were going on for free to local children. Well, this was the uh, Tufts Delta Health Clinic which was established in Mount Bio in the hospital that was already existing in Mount, in Mount Bio, an all black town, which uh, we should, everybody should know about um, that all black town that uh, made a lot of headway into uh, um, uh, progress for the black community. This is where um, during segregation, black people could go to the hospital. There were many, um, Black people who died or who got severely ill because they would not be admitted into the white, so-called white hospitals. Um, and sometimes when they did go, they could have to st stand in the back and, re and receive uh, inferior treatment. But at any rate, um, in 1965, we started the Head Start program the um, CDGM Child Development Group of Mississippi and the Tufts Delta Health Clinic um, would give exams for the Head Start children before they would uh, go to head to uh, the preschools. They were able to take exams to prepare them to see uh, what was happening with them. So the, the parents would bring their children, look how nice everybody was dressed up. And it was a source of pride to be able to come and um, uh, to the center and receive the treatment. Uh, the doctor with his back facing us, I think it was Dr. Aaron Shirley, who was, um, is from, was from Jackson. And uh, he died about three or four years ago. Uh, Dr. Aaron Shirley and Dr. James Anderson mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Smith, uh, all those three doctors were involved with the Tufts Delta Health Clinic. And Dr. Smith still lives in Jackson. Dr. Right. Anderson and Dr. Aaron Shirley passed away, right. but they made an outstanding contribution to the development of the Tufts Delta Health Clinic. Um, I'm glad you made mention to those doctors because we actually showcase uh, Dr. Shirley's work and Dr. Anderson's work on display in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and also the CDGM as well. Um, so we've, we've talked about a lot of the photographs and some of the photographs that are shown in the exhibit. Uh, can you explain how you were selected for this, um, for this project and your relation to Bill Ferris? How I was selected for the for, exhibit? Yeah, like how your how are how are your photographs selected for this compilation uh, that Bill Fer Ferris uh, curated? Well, Bill Ferris and um, a couple of his colleagues, Bill Ferris at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, who's a former director of the Center for Southern uh, American Studies, and uh, they had a relationship. Uh, partnership with the University of Montpellier, France, and they decided to uh, have this exhibit open, uh, an exhibit open in Montpellier, France in 2018. So Dr. Ferris and I worked together at Jackson State in 1970, I believe it was 70, 70, 71, 
and uh, he knew of he knew me and he knew of my work over the years. We've been in contact off and on. And um, I used to have exhibits, uh, African sculpture exhibits and photography uh, at uh, Jackson State. He was familiar with my work. So when he um, decided to uh, have uh, co-sponsored this exhibit in France, he contacted me and said he wanted to uh, have some of my photographs um, in the photo in the exhibit and so you know I sent him a lot of photographs we had he had someone come and, and take photographs of my photographs and um, so I was selected to uh, have the work in the exhibit and out of the 17 photographers that whose work was in the exhibit in France in 2018 I was the only female uh, my husband and I went over for the opening. At that time, um, I was the only photographer who, whose work was in the show that actually went to the opening. Um, at the time, uh, James Meredith was uh, highlighted for his uh, contribution and his uh, to civil rights and, and his integration of the Ole Miss and other, all of everything that he's done. And he was highlighted there uh, as a speaker. Lonnie Bunch was going to be the keynote speaker at this opening of the exhibit in France and he couldn't come. So Bill Ferris asked James Meredith and I to uh, be presenters. Uh, in an interview on stage uh, for uh, all of the audience uh, for the keynote, so that was quite a quite a, a most definitely a, a great uh, event. So, yeah. Dr. Ferris wanted to. There was a catalog that was developed for that exhibit. Um, it was in French. I didn't have any pictures in that one, but. Uh, when the exhibit uh, was going to travel, they decided to have it open at uh, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum as the first uh, exhibit in this country. And Bill Ferris had a new catalog developed um, in English and he included, he decided to, uh, thought it would be good to have my photographs involved and my uh, photographs especially relating to the uh, shooting at Jackson State. I have a whole chapter of my work in this new book, which is out now. I am a man and it's yeah. published by um, the Mississippi Press. Right, it's actually so, sold uh, here in the museum as well. So at the bookstore, correct? Right. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Very good. So, um, after the exhibit, I guess, leaves in is the Mississippi Museum, there will be some other universities that will have the exhibit or could have the other, or could have the exhibit, museums, et cetera, that it could travel. Okay. And the uh, when it travels, it might be the same or it could take a different shape um, because the exhibit at EMDA is not the exact same exhibit as the one in France. It's some of it, but not all of it, because the one in France, exhibit in France, was the entire museum. I mean, it was really a tremendously large exhibit. So, but it, so here's the book that you were discussing. Um, it's the catalog that uh, Dr. Bill Ferris put together with um, all of the photographs in the exhibit and it's in English and this is where uh, Dr. Derby has her photographs of the shooting that took place at Jackson State um, uh, that she was just talking about that you know claim the lives of Gibbs and Green um, and so all of that is here in this book that you can find at the museum store here at the two Mississippi museums you can purchase this book here as well. Um, it was actually the aftermath of the shooting. Aftermath right? of the shooting. The after the shooting it happened at midnight and uh, in the dark and uh, nobody knew that was going to happen. But I have photographs 
of the aftermath with the, uh, the students protesting and the march and the hearings of congressmen who came to find out about what happened and uh, the burial, the funeral and the burial of the, uh, James Green, right. uh, mm -hmm. the man who was killed uh, by the police in the shooting. Right. Now, before we go to questions, because we do have a few questions, or some questions, some questions, um, we just want to make mention that the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State did a program with you on your photographs of uh, that particular aftermath of shooting of, of the shooting at Jackson State University. So you just want to say that that is still on their website and I think on their YouTube as well. And so you could hear Dr. Derby and um, uh, Dr. Robbie Luckett discuss those photographs because, if I'm not mistaken, was it last year or this year was the, uh, the com a commemoration, a big commemoration of that actual event. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't know if it was the 50th or 55th commemoration of the... The 50th, the 50th. Uh, 50th uh, anniversary of the shooting. Right. Uh, May 1970. But um, I have the, the exhibit that we had planned for the commemoration could not be shown uh, because of the COVID. Right. But it is up now. And uh, we're thinking uh, hopefully that in May we may be able to have the opening when the two young men that were assassinated were um, will be given uh, degrees, honorary degrees, college degrees um, in May for the graduation. And my exhibit is actually up with 60 photographs that depict the aftermath. And uh, they are up at George, uh, Jackson State. Um, so it's not open to the public, but it is open for special groups. Okay. And it was part of it was shown uh, in this talk or interview that I that I gave last week. Gotcha. Now we're having a little technical difficulties with the questions, so not, they're not coming through, but. While that's happening, could you talk more about your um, projects that you have coming up in the future, things that you're working on, uh, video projects? I know you're doing uh, uh, film as well as photography. So share with the audience what you have coming up. Um, well, let's see. I do have um, a program coming up with a young lady in South Carolina. Ashley, Dr. Ashley Carr Gilmore. She has started a program to encourage young women to go into higher education and to also uh, think about the Air Force as an option for um, uh, achieving her ed their education. And um, she has a, a website, Big Blue Mentoring. So I have uh, established a scholarship in the name of my husband and I to, um, for her to utilize with her program to encourage her. Um, and this scholarship is meaningful because it is in my name and my husband's name. And it is an honor of service to our country through civil rights activities and through the military service. So I see both of them, those uh, types of service because we were SNCC and SCLC Corps, we were in the thick of things. We were fighting for our country for our people and for our country as a whole, America. And I see that we were in a war zone in Mississippi. People were in a war zone in Alabama and Georgia and other places. Mm -hmm. So this award is to encourage young women to be of community service and to also think about the military as a service for themselves to end their country 
in order to um, uh, in order to help them to uh, get more career direction and to also have um, education. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ashley Gilmore uh, received her undergraduate degree, her master's and her PhD, PhD through being through in the military service. She's a mother, she has two children, she has a husband. And uh, we're very proud of her. She is our granddaughter. And so I did establish a scholarship for uh, young women, a young woman every year to receive something, a laptop or something to help them to uh, promote their education. So that is going to be on February 22nd, okay. Big Blue Mentoring. Great. And if no one is interested, they can look it up on the website. Okay. Ashley, Dr. Ashley Carr Gilmore. So that's on the 22nd. Uh, in, in March, I would have been invited by Emory University to, and uh, Emory University, the Rose Library and the uh, Creative Arts section uh, in connection with the True Colors Theater in Atlanta. Jamil Jude as director, and Vicki Crawford, Dr. Vicki Crawford, uh, author and professor at Morehouse College. Uh, they will be, they have invited me to be on a panel to uh, celebrate the life of C.T. Vivian and John Lewis, both of whom I worked with. I am on the board of the C.T. Vivian Foundation presently, so I have been, had been working closely with C, Dr. C.T. Vivian and his family and other board members. So those are two activities that I can think of right now. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And I hope um, the visitors, I mean, the uh, viewers are able to get in touch um, and, and take part in, in those two things that you mentioned. Oh, I have one other thing I want to talk about, and that is uh, the photography group women's photography group, black women's photography group here in Atlanta, Sistography, and uh, we are going, we have an exhibit um, at the Roots Roswell Festival, and we are going to uh, have a scholarship award um, to a, one of the members of the organization that has been involved in the intersection of the arts, social justice, and education. Okay. So that's on the 21st of February. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Derby. Before we, we go, because we're going to close out in about seven minutes, but we did have a question that I think should be asked of you. Um, it, it's basically saying, you know, we've heard of violence happening and, and dangerous things happening to, um, to, to members of the movement, leaders of the movement, especially here in Mississippi. Did you actually come into any danger or, or violence while you were documenting uh, the movement through your lens? Well, I, I came into danger in all aspects of the movement that I was in um, when I was in Mississippi and in Georgia. Uh, in Mississippi, um, uh, you know, you had to be very careful about riding in a car, in integrated car, because you could be chased or shot at, etc. But um, when I went out into the field to stay in the co-ops, or and when I worked in the Head Start program in the in the Delta, in Durant, uh, I stayed in the homes of independent Black farmers and uh, they protected us, the family. Um, their houses were shot into. And uh, I remember when Hattie Sappho from Durant, Durant uh, Mississippi and I, she's the uh, head of the Durant, the um, second, let's see. Well, Durant uh, Head Start. 
and we were, we had gone grocery shopping and we came back and um, I was sitting in the passenger seat looking out the window and I saw that there was a, 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 a fire going on a rope into uh, the church. That was the church that the Head Start program had first been in and had later built another one and moved to it. And so we stopped and the rope was going up the steps of the church and it would have caught fire if we hadn't uh, gotten out and stopped it. Um, yes, uh, yeah. I had one time we stopped at the gas station. This was like around 1971. Somebody else, if I was driving this, we were going to New Orleans. And uh, I got out. Now, this was supposed to be after integration, of course. And uh, it went to go into the bathroom. And the gas station owner, white guy, came up and with his, his hand on his gun, on his hip, and said, don't go in there, meaning the ladies' room. Mm -hmm. You had to go to uh, outside mm -hmm. or colored. So I had, I have had encounters with racism directly, violence, yes. In the Head Start Center in Durant, the, um, we had, there were guns, there were rifles in each corner of the building, just in case. Because, you know, back then segregationists did not want you to do anything to progress. You couldn't start schools. You can, you know, aren't supposed to start independent schools, Head Start programs, economics, anything. You weren't supposed to vote. You weren't supposed to register. Uh, they didn't want you to do anything that would bring progress. And anytime you did anything, you could have your life threatened. It just depended on where you were, when you were. Um, I did meet Schwerner Goodman and Cheney the summer of 19... 64 yeah. when they came into town and within a couple of weeks after i left i met them they were killed wow it could have happened to any of us yeah. i had friends i knew people in the movement who were killed beaten in jail beaten outside of jail etc so violence was nothing to sneeze at it was always could be around you. Yes, ma'am. Um, one last question. Um, a viewer asked, did you ever meet Dr. Ernest Withers of Memphis? He's a great biographer. Photographer, sorry. Photographer. photographer. Yes, yes. Our paths crossed from time to time. Okay. Yes. And uh, his, his daughter uh, was in France with us uh, at the opening of the exhibit. Roz, okay. and I owe her an email. <laughs> well, we want to thank you for your time and uh, sharing those stories and giving those backstories to the photographs that we have on exhibit here at the museum. Again, it's titled I Am a Man, and it's a compilation of civil rights photographs between 1960 and 1970 that was guest curated by Dr. Bill Ferris. And as we've just uh, learned, Dr. Doris Derby is a major contributor to that exhibit. And so, we, again, we want to thank you. The exhibit is actually up until August 21st. So if you have not seen it uh, in person, please come to the museum. We are practicing uh, social distancing, um, um, social distance and, and wearing a mask. But you can come in and see the museum, I mean, see the exhibit safely and uh, hopefully learn more about the movement through photographs. Um, do you have anything else to say, Dr. Derby, before we end the program? Well, I'd like to thank you for uh, having me to uh, be present and to be interviewed and to show my work. I have been um, uh, involved with the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement before it was even a reality uh, and worked with MDA, Mississippi Department of Archives and History. I've enjoyed uh, 
knowing everyone uh, that has worked there and met you. And um, I am very happy that I met Pam Jr., the, the director, and uh, the other, uh, Lucy, and so many other uh, persons there. So I, I am glad that uh, you were able to have this exhibit. Yeah. And I hope you'll have more, uh, you know, along these lines. I know you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've enjoyed uh, this program with you. Thank you. And mm -hmm. I guess that's it. Yeah. Uh, it was, it's, it's so funny how things come full circle. I remember writing about you in college, and now here I am interviewing you at, at my job. So, you know, that's the one thing. I know you ask, you, want, you always ask me, when am I going to see the paper? You're not going to see the paper. <laughs> But we do want to make mention to the, photo, uh, the painting behind me, um, the I'm a Man painting. It, it was done by a um, young uh, high school student by the name of Ezria Robinson. She is a high school student here in Jackson, Mississippi, and um, has, you know, we, we are using her uh, painting right now as a backdrop for this program. So we want to thank Ezria Robinson and hope that she continues using her art um, to bring light to civil rights issues of the past and hopefully uh, the present. So thank you, Ezria. And again, thank you, Dr. Derby. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, people who are viewing through Facebook Live. We want to thank you for uh, tuning in. This has been a great program. And again, like Dr. Derby said, hopefully we can continue to bring more content to you um, about this great exhibit. So thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your, um, your day. <laughs>